Welcome to Radio Davos, the weekly podcast from the World Economic Forum that looks at the world's biggest problems and how we might solve them in this special episode, technology. What are the technological breakthroughs that could help us solve some of those problems? To look into that, I'm joined by my colleague, Greta Keenan. Hi, Greta, how are you? Hi, Robin, thanks for having me. You work at the Centre for the Fourth Industrial Revolution at the World Economic Forum. You're very heavily involved in the report we're going to be talking about today. Tell us about this report. Absolutely. So the Top 10 Emerging Technologies Report is an annual report of the World Economic Forum that brings together insights from over 90 experts across 20 countries to list the most promising breakthrough technologies of the next three to five years. It has a legacy, strong legacy over the last 10 years. And since the first edition in 2011, the report has really called out technologies that were little known at the time, but then went on to have a huge societal impact. One such example being genomic vaccines or mRNA vaccines, which we put on the list in 2016, that then went on to become years later, a few years later, the technology underpinning the majority of life-saving COVID vaccines around the world. So we're really proud of the history of this report. And we were really excited to, just a few weeks ago, launch the 2023 edition of the report. Um, and just as we have in the past, the report is really to serve professionals across industries and help them anticipate the new technologies that are emerging, understand their potential impact, and then really positively shape the outcomes for economies and societies. We were proud to do this in collaboration with Frontiers and excited today to talk to you, Robin, about what those 10 technologies are. Yeah, and we've looked at this on Radio Davos in the past. We've done two episodes before on previous editions of this one. People can go back and listen to those and to see if we were right in those forecasts. And I'm delighted to say we've got the same guests on this time as we had on last time. Greta, could you introduce them to us? Absolutely. So behind this report is a fantastic steering group of experts who have the hard job every year of whittling down almost 100 different technology nominations down to the 10 that make it into the report each year. And we're really pleased today to be joined by the two people who've really been championing that effort over the last decades as the co-chairs of our steering group. We have today joining us Mariette de Cristina, Dean and Professor of the Practice of Journalism at Boston University College of Communication, and Bernie Mayerson, Chief Innovation Officer Emeritus at IBM. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you both again. Um, before we get in, we're going to go through this list one by one. There's 10 technologies that you've helped pick out. Could maybe, Bernie, could you tell us what are the criteria you use when you're whittling down just to 10 technologies each year? At the end of the day, it's scale and impact. If you think about it, you're looking at what's going to have a profound impact on society, on technology, on science, on business. It really is going to be the scale of that impact that we look for, because at the end of the day, remember the word we use in this is emerging. Emerging literally means the technology has to grow to some significance within the three to five year period. So those are our metrics. And then based upon that, you actually have to do the very difficult job of forecasting the future, which Marianne and I have struggled with for years where you look at all of these excellent proposals and say which ones are going to, quote, win and emerge. And the group we have is fabulous. They've really done an extraordinary job in terms of helping us whittle it down. Great. I'd just like to add quickly to what Bernie said. He got that absolutely right about the scaling. And one way we probe that is we talk a lot about, is it truly novel? Is it really building in a significant way? Does it have the power to disrupt? And you know, it, we, we call it depth, but what we mean by that is, uh, is there more than one company or more than one group exploring it, which will help add to that? Right. It must be a tricky job because you've got technologies which are, are still relatively small and you're having to think three or five years in the future what it could become. Um, Greta, over to you. So now that we know, you know what the criteria are to get onto this top 10 list, let's, let's get into it. Um, artificial intelligence is constantly making headlines these days. And of course, two of the technologies on the 2023 list are AI related. Bernie, perhaps you can tell us about what those technologies are. Well, if you take a look at what's going on in the world, generative AI, you know, chat GPT, is just something that's hitting it out of the park in terms of people's interest in it. 
It's, it's truly extraordinary. Um, the ability of it to basically help you go through and actually say, this is an answer that as a human being might have taken me months to generate, or I might not even have the skills, generative AI and chat GPT, it basically can come back and give you this answer you might have sought for months or years or maybe never gotten. That's the good news. But we, we tend to be very balanced here in terms of looking at what we call lights and shadows. Generative AI basically trains upon the existing data that's out there in the world and says, from that data, I can then parse together this answer that you're looking for, whether it's a description of a Shakespearean epic or is something as straightforward as what would a painting look like of somebody who's basically ice skating in a competition? I mean, literally, it has that broad aesthetic capabilities. The caveat and the, quote, shadow people worry about is how far can it emerge? In other words, how far can it go in terms of actually displacing human effort? And that has been a contentious area, which we're not ignoring. But there are such positive things it can do at this time that it deserves to be on the list. If you think about it, for instance, in healthcare. Think about forgetting about just it can help a dentist, for instance, identify it from an image there's an issue in your mouth. That's that's a fairly obvious one. But what about areas where you go deep into the hinterlands of a country where you don't even have medical services? And you actually have, however, a connection to an AI that has actually been trained in medicine. It has actually read literally the entire body of medical evidence. And if given some very basic information on symptoms, for instance, can actually come back and say, we're probably dealing with this. That's access. And basically leveling the playing field globally in terms of accessing healthcare and getting treatment, therefore, it's an extraordinary evolution. And it is, in fact, taking place today. There are places in India, in fact, which did not have medical services, which are getting them through this means. And it is, it is clearly something that is going to be emergent over the next three to five years in terms of bringing up the standard of medical care globally, even where the educational system is not yet caught up, creating the ability for the local uh, institutions to provide such care. So these are just two, you know, obviously disparate things. But when you look at them, and perhaps Marriott could comment, if you look at AI and chat GPT, the challenge that you're faced with, of course, is it also, when misused, can generate answers to questions where you're attempting to train a student, and the student just gets out on the web and basically pops up an answer that looks absolutely great and has nothing to do with their own ability. I mean, I know that's a setup, Marriott, but it is a challenge you face in particular. Thank goodness. Uh, and as people develop new AI technologies, they usually develop ways to uh, detect whether they've been used. And that's one of the things we we do in education. But one thing I, I would like to add uh, to what Bernie's been saying that really struck me as I was looking over the list is that the power of data science, AI, and computing is really throughout the entire list. We singled out a couple where the AI advances were particularly noteworthy, but that power of using computation and data to take a systems approach really runs through the entire list. Yeah, and it is, by the way, there is a very interesting emergent field, interesting in defeating AI. It always goes like that. In fact, there is a very clever bit of work going on which might make the list next year, you never know, which is how do you detect AI's use in places it is not meant to be used? And as one example, Human beings have many, many different ways of saying the same thing in words, and they randomly select words that would give you the same outcome. Turns out you can actually set it up so that a system such as AI <coughs> to identify itself always chooses among, let's say, 10 different word options. It always chooses one. And therefore, if you look at a response where it has actually used all words that you know are actually AI affiliated, even though they could be randomly used, and you compare it to what should occur. If all the words that AI would basically now to identify itself appear in an answer that you're given, you know it was produced by AI as opposed to a student handing it in. It actually is very, very clever. There are, there is, it's, it's inevitable that there is a plus and a minus 
The good news is the world is beginning to deal with it proactively. So poor Marriott will not have to sweat whether somebody has actually used their brain or their fingers. Yeah, generative AI, it might be people listening to this are saying, what do you mean emerging? It's emerged because in the last six months, everyone, it would seem, uh, but there's, uh, everyone, it seems, is using it. However, those applications in healthcare or in medicine, we're still really in the foothills, I think, of what this technology can, can bring us. Um, do you want to go, Gret, on to the next one? Sure, absolutely. So we just heard about generative AI and AI-facilitated healthcare, which made the top 10 list. Um, there are, of course, other technologies on the list that are related to health and healthcare. Um, perhaps, Mariette, you want to start us off with something called spatial omics. What is that and why is it on the list this year? So um, thinking about healthcare and about what we can see and know, I think we've all seen a picture of a cell, right? That looks pretty. Or maybe you've seen pictures of, of brains where there's uh, an area of the brain that's active. But the problem with those previous pictures is that they're quite static and your brain, your body, all your metabolism is moving constantly with thousands and thousands, I mean, so many thousands. In fact, there are more than 37 trillion cells in our bodies right now, all actively working away. And to get a sense of what they're doing in between the one snapshot, or in the case of brain imaging, things that are done at a fraction of a second, you know, here we are going to soon be able to turn to spatial omics. And this is using advanced imaging technologies and the specificity and resolution of DNA sequencing combined. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, a lot of computing power behind it. And what can we see? Well, we can see processes actually unfolding. And the ability to see those processes unfolding, whether they're you know, a part of your metabolism or how your brain is working or how other areas are working, gives you two things. First, critically, a better understanding of actually what's going on. There are many things, like if I have a headache, that headache could be, oh, I don't know, it could, could be that I, I just got a concussion. It could be I have a tumor. It could be something else. Sometimes things present in the same way, and only if you can really see the mechanisms underneath them can you understand what's going on. And then second, and critically, once you understand in detail, you can then develop therapeutics to approach challenges. Like um, if I had a, a cancer tumor, uh, this technology could be used to exactly see what was unraveling in my cells and um, come up with approaches to tailor cancer treatments to that um, tumor or tumors in your body. So it's a, it's a kind of an amazing technology in the next several years. Uh, we, you know, financial folks forecast that it will more than triple in its growth and impact. And um, I, I think we've been watching this one in the committee for, for years and waiting to see when we could say, all right, within three to five years, we're going to see a real impact here. And that is spatial omics. Spatial omics. Well, that's a term most of us won't have heard before. You've been discussing it for years in the committee. Where did you, where, where does the word, what, what is an omic? Where does this word come from? <laughs> Omics is often applied to different areas of study in biology where we're understanding the processes of something like me metabolomics, uh, <laughs> genomics, you used that word not too long ago. Uh, so get used to the word omics. It's it's often applied to, you know, to the study of different areas and spatial here, understanding the spaces and how that they how they move along in the body. Great. Greta, on to the next. So we've heard about spatial omics. Um, another one of the medical themed technologies on this year's list is designer phages. Again, probably something no one's ever heard of. So Bernie, do you want to talk us through that one? Sure. It's interesting. Uh, basically, a phage is a delivery vehicle of information. In this particular case, you actually are taking a virus. And one of the things virus do to replicate themselves is they deliver information into your DNA that essentially causes to replicate themselves when it's an infectious agent. However, designer phages are a very different approach. What you do then is imagine you have a tub of a given bacteria and you wanna manufacture something. And as an example, literally maybe manufacture insulin. Believe it or not, you can actually inject into the actual mix 
a, a a phage which has been designed so that its DNA, when it injects it into, or the fraction of its DNA that is injected into the bacteria it attacks, turns that bacteria into a factory. And that's a fascinating thing. It's a very clean sort of thing where if you design the phage correctly, it will actually insert DNA information into the bacteria that are present to turn them into factories for highly desirable things in vast quantity, whether it be a drug, whether it be insulin, whether it be any other chemical that you actually need in a biologic process. It's a remarkable thing. And in terms of manufacturing, if you think about it, it's very natural. You know, it's not like you're going out and getting some magic ingredients and going and mixing them up and hoping for the best outcome. This literally is exactly tailored. And it's kind of, if you think of it, it's an offshoot of something we pointed out, you know, years ago, CRISPR-Cas, where you actually do gene editing. It's gene editing, but it's done with a remarkable simplicity, literally using a designer phage, a virus that has been tailored to do the editing for you at scale. And it's interesting, again, that remember the word scale comes up. So it is something that is really revolutionary in terms of, oddly as it may sound, manufacturing. Literally, it's a biological manufacturing system that is making use of a virus to do your work for you. And that's, that's damn impressive and will become important because if you want to talk about you know, low-cost drugs and the cost of drugs, one way of really driving that down is being able to do a very natural process that involves creating the drug through some sort of fairly straightforward biologic process that then scales enormously. I have, I have heard the word phage before. I, I believe you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't there some relation to the fight against antimicrobial resistance? Antimicrobial? Micro <laughs> Tell me. So, drug so resistance. <laughs> That's the one, drug resistance. Yes. The antibiotics that are in current use today, the challenge you have with them, of course, is what happens is, let's say they kill off 99.99% of the bacteria. You have to really worry about that 0.001% that survived and how they manage that. And it may be that they have some disruptive genetic information that prevents it from being attacked by this antibiotic that you've applied. And unfortunately, over the course of many years, as you kill off bacteria that are susceptible to your drug, the only ones left are the ones that are resistant to it. So you better find other ways of attacking them, one of which is, again, using these virus that are capable of genetic alteration such that they can actually make the necessary alterations in this biologic agent you're using for attacking these uh, microbes that render them, once again, essentially susceptible to attack or attack them directly literally by inserting some fatal uh, genetic disorder into the microbe itself using the phage as an actual weapon. So it is, you've made a very good point that this addresses yet another one of the challenges we're facing due to oddly enough, the success of modern medicine. So phages selectively target specific bacterium and this enables you to not knock out everything, let's say you're taking antibiotics, not knock out everything, the good and the bad bacteria, but selectively focus on one. So if you can use CRISPR-Cas9 or other genome editing technologies to modify that phage to target the exact bacterium that you want, then you're going to have a much more precise outcome. So I think some of those examples within medicine, um, in drug design, but also in um, preventing antimicrobial resistance are really showing the impact of this technology. Thanks, Bernie. What's the next one? Shall I, shall I go to it, Greta? Perfect. It says here on my list, the next one, we're still on health, we're on mental health. And turning to you, Mariette, how can the metaverse help our mental health? So although we've all heard of, of meta and maybe we, we haven't really engaged with it so much yet, um, one thing that's scaling, and again, we're using that word scaling and computing, can do for us is help address a chronic but really underappreciated problem of all of humanity, and that is mental health. I remember some years ago, while I was still a science journalist uh, steadily, I uh, read about a decadal mental health study that was done in the U.S. every decade, and the thing that really struck me was about half the people in the U.S. at some point in their lives would suffer some form of mental illness, and that 20% or more would suffer clinically depression at some point in their lives. These are huge numbers. And, but everybody gets 
Similarly, a cold now and again, everybody gets other kinds of illnesses. So why don't we fully appreciate and grapple with what the U.S. Surgeon General has called the, the, the health court issue of our time? And the metaverse for health stands poised to help us with that. So just as we are all right now sitting in different places around the world and engaging with each other, you can harness these technologies, but in a more uh, kind of amped up version to help with health, uh, mental health diagnoses and treatment. And that's what the metaverse stands to do. Um, we already have seen some signals of this coming technologies. For example, gaming companies have for some years now started to offer some uh, mental health benefits. For instance, um, Deep, My, Deep Well Therapeutics has created video games that help address problems of depression and anxiety. And there are others and there will, will be more coming along to grow. What's going to bring it all together is our new uh, metaverse for health and computing platforms. And eventually, I hope, you know, when it's hard to find a, a clinic, you know, a, a mental health professional to, uh, to help support you in your care, we'll be able to find that more reliably and more, um, you know, more readily than, than we would have had in the past. I was actually doing an interview this morning, this morning with the head of a, um, or someone senior in a metaverse company. It'll be on another episode of Radio Davos. And she uses uh, the metaverse, she does mindfulness every morning and she does it sitting on top of an iceberg in the North Pole. So that's the environment she surrounds herself with. Um, presumably it's less cold than that, but there's this calming place for her to do her, her uh, mindfulness. So I guess, you know, that's an everyday application that could be used to help mental health. Bernie, you were going there is a fascinating example also that I've seen in Australia where they actually have a company that does human-like avatars. And what they found was in mental health treatment, they found that people on the autism spectrum in a broad range of it, in fact, active, actively worked well with this avatar, better with an avatar than with a real human. They felt they could tell that it was clearly an avatar. And I think with intent, the avatar was made to be clearly evident as non-human, but nonetheless very human-like. And they found that those who called in for help worked very well over Zoom and other technologies with the avatars as opposed to humans. And it is a very powerful example that we should not assume that, well, you need the human touch. There's a certain disconnect in some ends of the spectrum in autism where there's a level of comfort found using the metaverse as opposed to real people. And so there's a really incredibly broad range of applications we have yet to explore. So thanks for walking us through some of the medical related technologies on this year's list. But obviously for any technology to have those real world applications in medicine, they often require similar advances in engineering. Um, Bernie, tell us a bit about flexible neural electronics. What are they and what advances have we seen on the engineering side of things to earn this technology a spot in this year's list? It, it really is an enormous technical challenge in several of the things that we'll discuss in a moment. You're really talking about just enormous materials challenges. Think about this. You're actually putting something into the human body that has to maintain its location, that has to interact with neighboring cells without damage, and has to extract some sort of data from it and transmit it to the outside world without further damaging the location it's, it's at. That is an enormous challenge in medicine, and particularly with implants. And really, the reason it earned this is we're finally seeing the ability to take electronics and, first of all, render them flexible. That's not trivial. If you've ever taken a silicon wafer and tried flexing that, you must enjoy getting little chips of silicon. I don't mean good chips. I mean the broken pieces. You know, ain't a lot of flex there. Um, the remarkable thing now is there are new classes of electronics that are actually flexible, physically flexible. You can bend them without damage. More importantly, they now have biologic coatings over them that enable you to implant them in incredibly sensitive areas like the brain and extract direct signals. In, in the holy grail, 
of this work. You want to take somebody who, because of, for instance, a stroke or a spinal cord injury, you want to be able to take the necessary information from the brain and bypass the damage back to a region where you can then drive motor function, for instance, that was otherwise lost. In order to do that, you have to have incredibly precise connectivity to where that information is coming from, which is the human brain. Previous sensors were either A, external to the brain, but because of local motion, literally of the brain, you constantly had to retune them, and or inflexible electronic elements placed on the brain, which had a tendency to slip around and also were not remotely as friendly to the surrounding tissue because they're not flexible. So the fact that these implants are now being used and are proving to be both biologically compatible and good at extracting data. It's the very beginning of a revolution that hopefully will resolve many of the challenges we've currently had with enabling those with an impediment due to some sort of either brain injury and or physical injury, loss of connectivity through uh, various parts of the body. It would really help resolve those things in a remarkable way. It's, it's really the holy grail. And so the, it's not necessarily the scale that it actually is in some widespread use at the moment, but the impact would be almost unimaginable to people who are essentially quadriplegic in the longer term. So it's something that has a really good future, and it is now finally, at least, becoming a reality in terms of execution. That's flexible neural electronics. So we've talked about implants or sensors in the brain, but another one on the list is sensors in a plant. I was watching a World Economic Forum social video on this just yesterday, and I had no idea this was possible. Mariette, tell us about wearable plant sensors. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it is amazing technology. I mean, if one of the things that really strikes me when I was, again, looking over the report, the UN has said that by 2050, we'll need to increase food production by 70% to feed the world's population. At the same time as everybody on, you know, who's listening to this knows or watching this knows, we're struggling with various issues around climate and how uh, different growing conditions are changing. We also, a little earlier today, talked about systems in the body and how in the past we might have been able to take a picture or a series of pictures, but being able to look steadily provides us with revelations on what's actually going on at the ground. And in the same way we could do this in the human body, of course, we could do this for plants. And um, these wearable plant sensors, the idea is you get a non-invasive, well, maybe it, it, it pokes a little into the, one of the leaves, sensor that can monitor resistance in the plant. And by doing so, can tell folks who are watching it, it does it have adequate nutrition? How is its water supply? Is it getting enough sun? And the difference here is going from being able to take very low, you know, sort of quality satellite pictures of a field down to exactly what's happening, one plant to the next. And this will enable us to help feed the world. When you say resistance, you actually mean electrical resistance, right? Yeah, this is the thing that amazed me. I had no idea that there was any kind of electrical signals passing through a plant. But in fact, that is what this is measuring, right? Yeah, well, actually, all of our cells, you know, our cells, the plant cells, anything alive uses teeny tiny electrical signals to communicate and, uh, you know, to transmit information. Uh, we are, I suppose, different in some ways, in many ways from electronics, but we do contain our own little uh, voltages going on in our bodies and the plants do too. And by measuring those electrical light, little electrical changes in the plant, the sensors will be able to give a lot of precision to what's going on in the field, and they enable us to get the maximum we can out of every acre on the world. What do you think are going to be the biggest challenges in terms of reaching scale for this kind of technology, Marriott? I mean, it seems amazing that we could have that level of precision for each individual plant within a field or many, many fields uh, in agriculture, but how are we going to get there? 
Well, um, obviously, any new technology has a bit of work that it needs to get to really be emergent. I mean, the sensors themselves have a cost to them. It's a cost that's now not yet applied to agriculture. And to bring that cost down, scaling will need to happen. And that's always a bit of a chicken and an egg uh, you know, event. These sensors have to be applied in some way. I mean, we do have to put plants, you know, the seeds and plants in the ground so that they they will need to get, we'll need to find some efficient way to connect them. And then, of course, uh, we're going to need to, to manage all the computing associated with hundreds of thousands of plants. Yeah, and there is progress in an area. It has a bizarre name called smart dust. But remember that the miniaturization now possible with chips literally means you could build a chip that would, you would look at it and you would say, good Lord, that's a speck of dust that it would be an entire sensor with communication capability, where in theory, at least, you could literally fly a drone over a field and just sprinkle them, and enough of them would land on the targeted plants to get the data. So technology is moving in a direction that ultimately it will become pervasive. Um, it's a question of really how fast. It's not if. So you've told us a bit about flexible neural electronics and wearable plant sensors. Naturally, for any technology or electronic to be flexible, it's going to have to be powered by something that is equally flexible, uh, which brings us on to one of the technologies on this year's list. Um, Bernie, do you want to tell us a bit about flexible batteries? Yeah, it, you've hit the point on the head. You've hit the, the, the issue right on the head, which is if you think about what you want to do, for instance, where you want to make uh, medical care essentially a medical knowledge pervasive, one of the best things you could do, as an example, is you take a shirt like mine and you embed sensors in it, but you have to transmit the data from those sensors or store that data so it can be transmitted later. Not to mention, you have to take the data, and to do that, you need power. People have really come a long way in, in basically now making flexible lithium ion or other types of batteries which are remarkably, remarkably um, resilient, shall we say, against things that are, you know, ugly things, like you throw your shirt in the washing machine and you don't kill the battery. This is not a little deal, you know, a little problem. Um, the materials, it's really a point that this world is really coming to the level where we need material scientists to really dig in hard because these batteries, the capability of essentially extracting power in a way that you can make these kinds of sensing systems pervasive is crucial. I mean, think about this. There are many, many, many companies out there now that are building sensors that are wearable sensors that detect uh, blood glucose levels for those who are diabetics. Imagine how unbelievable a breakthrough it would be if you had a type one diabetic. This is a child who's born as a diabetic where instead of having to either prick their fingers <clears throat> or inject them daily, you actually had the ability to literally just put on pants or put on a shirt or put on an undershirt. And it literally could both sense the glucose level in the blood and transmit that in real time to regulate the glucose level at a fairly constant uh, point. Because the problem in a diabetic is when you have these big spikes in values of glucose level, that's what does damage to the body. To do that, you need power. And so that is why we believe there's both a tremendous demand for these kinds of batteries, and there's been enormous progress lately in actually achieving this. And it's not just a battery. You also have flexible electronics that literally use the motion of your body to generate power. I mean, there's a lot of approaches people are taking here, but because there's this tremendous need, that actually is part of what drives emergence, a demand for something, and there, the demand is there. So the technology and the material scientists who are working on it are, are working with pretty good success right now in literally generating stuff where you could build it into a piece of clothing and throw it in the laundry and it would still work. So we're, we're, we're along the way. And again, the three to five year horizon seems reasonable. One of the things I think about when I hear about new technological advances, you often think, oh, that's wonderful. But where's the downside? And the, the last two on the list here we're going to talk about are also related to energy. But we're looking at aviation, sustainable aviation. Weren't aeroplanes a marvelous invention? Aren't they still? But how do we make it sustainable? And the other one is, and it comes back to maybe the first thing we were talking about at the top of this list, sustainable computing. Generative AI, we've learned, uses a huge amount of power. 
to, and a huge amount of compute. So Mariette, maybe you can get green for us and tell us about sustainable aviation fuel and about sustainable computing. Thanks, Robin. And you're right. I mean, obviously, uh, some of these wonders of the modern age, like being able to get on an airplane, I'm doing that myself in a couple of hours. Um, they, they come with consequences that we need to grapple with, again, at a systems level. And again, you know, in a, in a kind of combined way with the benefits of computing. Talking about sustainable aviation fuel, aviation you know, it's it's a significant piece. It's not the biggest piece of carbon use, but a, but a quite a significant one, at about uh, two or three percent of all you know carbon dioxide or, or more uh, annually from aviation. But to you know to to make that work, to get car aviation carbon neutral, we're going to have to make tremendous changes in that fuel. And the problem is, you know, where it's relatively straightforward to get your uh, cars to be electric, right? Because it's we can have charging stations and you don't need to have huge amounts on board. Although, you know, there are a lot of mechanical and electrical problems to be solved. Aviation currently requires an extremely energy dense fuel and a small, you know, because you can only carry so much on that airplane and get it off the ground. So the challenges there are, are, are uh, quite a lot. Sustainable aviation fuel, Reminds me a little of when you see those uh, biologic fuels that you pump at the at the gas pump sometimes, where a portion of the fuel, the normal aviation fuel, is replaced by fuel that is either um, you know produced from biologic ingredients, and there are there are about ten or so different versions of sustainable aviation fuel, but uh, different different biological compounds, or by you know in court using non biologic, meaning taking carbon dioxide and treating the fuels in a different way to make them more, you know, to make them more uh, less energy impactful on the environment, less uh, biologically impactful on the environment. Today, I think it's about one or two percent of all, you know, airplanes use sustainable uh, aviation fuel, but we're going to have to increase that by about, you know, up to about 15 percent for air airlines to uh, become a more, you know, on the carbon neutral path by say 2040-ish on the way to 2050. And the good news is that there's a lot of energy because as Bernie just pointed out, there's a lot of demand and a lot of challenge here. So there's a lot of energy um, in trying to uh, produce additional types of sustainable aviation fuel used in different circumstances and to get those more available to the airlines that need them. That, I haven't been counting Greta, but I think that should have brought us to 10. We've done sustainable aviation well, fuel, but we ah, wanted to cover sustainable computing. I knew, I just felt there was <laughs> one. Robin, in case you had a question about that, but yeah, I wanted to touch on sustainable computing. Um, you know, data centers, as you rightly point out, use a, a tremendous amount of energy, um, something like 1% of all the energy produced in the world already today, which 1% of anything is a lot. And when you have to take a systems approach, you've got to look at all of the different pieces. So. Just to touch on this uh, briefly, because I know we're coming to the, the end of our program, you can manage heat management issues to try to bring energy costs down with liquid cooling systems. Um, AI, again, coming back to the beginning, is being used to analyze and optimize the power systems for sustainable um, day net zero energy centers for, uh, for sustainable computing and technology infrastructure supporting this as also being developed, being more modular and demand-based so that it is actually only responding as needed rather than burning the same amount of energy at all times. So yeah, going back almost to the beginning, uh, we do need to take care of our uh, reducing our energy uses to make uh, computing more sustainable as well. Yeah, there's actually a delightful also side effect of things like um, AI and the generative uh, AI training because these things do not require latency. And they're not, latency is not the issue. In other words, it's one thing when you type a search into something like Google and it spits out an answer in milliseconds. That's the latency, the delay you're willing to tolerate. But when you've got something like training ChatGPT, which literally can run for 10, 20 hours, even days, then what you can do is you can basically transport that computation to a region where energy is essentially carbon neutral or better 
And as an example, you know, you have people, for instance, in Iceland who are using geothermal power to do uh, working cryptocurrencies, same sort of thing. Latency isn't that crucial. You have people who have now moved their data centers to where there's proximity to hydropower. And again, it may be far away from where they're physically located, but because latency is not a crucial thing, you actually are able to dramatically reduce the carbon footprint because the source of your energy is in fact hydro or very clean. So it, it, it's really interesting. People are finally beginning to what I'll call parse the problem. Where latency is crucial, yes, you know, you have local computing sources. But where it's not, for crying out loud, we'll put it someplace where, you know, you don't have to burn down a forest in order to get the thing to work. And that is actually a very positive trend. And it's exactly what you've been talking about, Marriott, which is, you know, these are just knobs you can turn to dial down the energy demand for this technology. We've gone through the 10. Thank you very much. What amazes me, you know, this is the third time I've done this with you on Radio Davos, is they're 10 totally different technologies every year. It just shows you, and you're seeing dozens and dozens more that don't end up in this report. So it's a very impressive report. Congratulations to you. People can, it's called Top 10 Emerging Technologies of 2023. You can read the full report at weforum.org slash reports. Thanks to Greta for co-hosting, but thanks very much to Bernie and Mariette, who are co-chairs of the steering group for walking us through the top 10 of 2023. Thanks to both of you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us.